Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for watching this little lecture um, on YouTube. I'm sorry I'm under the weather and I'm, I'm not going to be able to make it in tomorrow. However, I uh, also don't want to lose any time this semester, so I thought I would um, get us through uh, a few scenes, a few scenes that I would have gone through um, this week on Thursday um, here online. Uh, by the way, also the addition of, I, I wasn't expecting to do this, so I didn't bring my um, book home. So the, I have a Norton edition here uh, that I'm using. It might be slight, the lineation might be slightly different than the lineation in your text. And the page numbers, of course, won't be um, the same at all. But nevertheless, I think that we can um, get through this fairly easy. Right now, I'm bringing us to Act 2, Scene 1. And around line 70, like line 71, you see here it begins, fare, he says farewell to Ronaldo. And then Ophelia enters and he says to her, you know, completing the line, how now, Ophelia, what's the matter? Um, Ophelia is very upset because Hamlet has uh, come to her room. And she says that he's acting crazy. And she, you know how in the earlier scene, um, Hamlet had described uh, the way in which he had been exhibiting uh, grief talking about, you know, how his visage was dejected and that sort of thing. Well, here Ophelia is talking about how he's displaying madness. And she talks about, uh, for instance, that he doesn't have a hat on his head. Uh, he has dirty stockings. Um, he's as pale as his shirt, she says. Um, and she describes him as being mad. Now, Polonius, interestingly from the very beginning says ask her is he mad for your love and she replies that she doesn't know and she goes on and then let me go to the next page here she goes on to talk about the way in which or Polonius says and this is about line um, 95 or so um, she says that, they, that he wants to take her to go see the king because he prescribes what's wrong with, with Hamlet is that it's the very ecstasy of love. And he wants to tell the king right away. And at the end of this, he, he says, have you given him hard words of late? And she says, you know, no, uh, but I didn't, um, uh, wouldn't accept his letters and I wouldn't um, give him, uh, I wouldn't let him come see me. And Polonius says immediately, that hath made him mad. And what you find here is that Polonius, well, first of all, Polonius makes a lot of assumptions. Polonius assumes that Hamlet is acting crazy because his daughter uh, won't uh, be his lover, I guess. Or that she's, um, his love for her is unrequited. It, it's interesting that the Polonius um, has a good good reason to, um, or a, it's not a good reason. You can understand why someone of Polonius's character would want Hamlet to have gone mad because of unrequited love for his daughter, and that is, if Polonius is is interested in socially or social mobility, interested in his his um, social station rising. And and he might do that by having his daughter married to a prince. Now recall that um, Laertes has already told Ophelia right before he leaves, you know, don't um, give Hamlet any, any time with you. He will, he'll just be using you because you're not, although you're, you know, you're born from a good family, you're not born from a family that's as good as the king's family. So if you uh, become Hamlet's girlfriend, he's just using you because he cannot marry you. He's a prince. Polonius here, however, it appears, seems to think that he has a way in for, to, for his daughter to become the wife of the prince. And that would benefit him. And the way is is to present his daughter's love as a way to cure Hamlet of his madness. What Polonius is describing here 
is uh, what we've been talking about, uh, about the humors, that Hamlet has passion inside of him. And if that passion is not, uh, doesn't find some sort of release, if the love is unrequited, then he'll just go get more mad. He'll remain sort of insane because of, uh, you know, too much of that hot humor inside of his body. Okay, so going on to the next scene. This is Act 2, Scene 2. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. These are two uh, Danish um, young people who have been to university with Hamlet. And they are being entertained, being kept as guests um, at the castle by the king and queen. And um, right here, uh, Polonius makes it clear that their purpose here is to find out what's the matter with Hamlet. He says at one point um, that Hamlet, the, the Hamlet's behavior is so startling that it, it has to be more than his father's death to have caused him to act this way. And obviously we've seen that, yes, his father's death uh, and his mother's or hasty marriage have both caused him to... Um, to grieve especially and to the extent that you know Polonius has called it unmanly and against nature however this is the description he's he's um the description that Polonius is making here happens after Hamlet uh has met the apparition and so presumably he's not just sad anymore but he's acting crazy so um Here's our first sort of indication that, or this, the first question we might have here is that, uh, I wonder if Hamlet, if the apparition really has made Hamlet act crazy, or if he's acting like he said he would be after the ghost. We don't actually know. We know that he said he would be acting crazy, and that would be an act. However, we don't know because after meeting the apparition by, uh, early modern ideas of madness and physiology, meeting an apparition like that could send him into madness. So the point of having Rosencrantz and Guildenstern there is so that they can uh, hang out with him as friends and they're essentially spies uh, to see what's going on with Hamlet and report back to the king and queen what they find out about Hamlet's behavior. Now I'm going to be turning. So Polonius and um, Ophelia go to, they uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern leave the king and queen and Polonius shows up. Polonius says um, that he has discovered what he, he calls it, the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. And Polonius sort of goes on and on and doesn't get to his point. Um, this is kind of comic relief for the play. Uh, he exacerbates uh, Gertrude, it seems, mostly. But he sort of goes on and on. And in the end, he, he, he said, well, he reads some of Hamlet's poetry to Ophelia. He critiques the poetry. He ends up saying that, you know, he has told his daughter that because Hamlet's a prince that he's beyond you know her realm um, and that he told her that she shouldn't um, receive his letters or receive him in person and and then describes what he believes is, is the situation and that is and he's, he there's a little joke here when he says and he repelled a short tale to make and right now right here he sort of wraps up what's happened to Hamlet in just a few lines. And the, the joke, of course, is that it's taken him a, quite a long time to actually get to the point. And the point is, is that Hamlet fell into sadness and then he didn't eat and then he couldn't sleep and that made him weak and that made him dizzy. And then he declined into madness wherein he now raves and we mourn for. 
oops, sorry. And the next thing that happens is that Polonius and the king hatch this plot. This is um, Polonius's idea that Hamlet has this habit of coming into this area of the, pa the, the palace and walking around. And just, it seems like he um, paces. Polonius's idea is that he and the king will hide behind what he calls an heiress, um, like a tapestry that hangs on a wall. They'll hide behind that so they can spy on Hamlet. And Ophelia will come along and she'll play a part. So it's if, as if there's a, that they're putting on a play. A play to, to catch Hamlet's conscience, to figure out what's going on in his mind. So they'll be sort of the audience. Ophelia will be acting, and she will prompt Hamlet to uh, perhaps reveal something about um, what's going on with him. And Polonius really hopes that this will be that he is madly in love with Ophelia. But before that happens, some players arrive. Polonius ushers them in to see Hamlet, and Hamlet has known them before, has known them on the continent. A couple of things that, to note at the, the beginning of, of what happens here is that Hamlet is wanting the character, he's an actor, he's called the first player. Uh, Hamlet is wanting the first player to speak a speech. And Hamlet says, first of all, this is a speech that this actor has uh, recited to him before. And Hamlet is unsure, however, whether or not that play was ever performed. So they must have been um, hanging out uh, as friends or, or whatever, and this actor performs this speech for Hamlet. Hamlet says, if it had been performed, it must have only been one time, and the audience must have not liked it very much because it didn't have a, I guess, presumably it didn't have a long run at any of the theaters. The second thing to say about this is that Hamlet remembers quite a bit of it. Um, he, he starts to, he begins, so this is all from memory. Um, I recall, you know, earlier in the play, Hamlet has told the apparition that he will forget everything and just seek and just kill Claudius. Obviously, he hasn't done that because he still has memory, in, 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 including in this, he has enough memory for um, the speech that that um, the player had spoken to him one time at some point in the past. A lot of critics note that, you know, that someone uh, in, in Shakespeare's time, that people must have had much um, stronger memories than especially we do these days. Because Hamlet, after hearing it one time, is able to, to remember and speak about, what is this, about a dozen lines of it. And then he breaks off because he, he doesn't remember anymore or something. And the first player begins with a speech, um, his part of the speech. The, the speech itself is um, Aeneas, so, so this comes from... The, the, the original source of the, of the story here is from Virgil's Aeneid. And um, Aeneid is telling this story to Dido. And it's a story that, that, that he knows from the Trojan War. And uh, in this uh, story, Pyrrhus is about, uh, or murders Priam. And he murders Priam uh, in... A full view of Priam's wife, Hecuba. So, there's a lot to say about this speech, but we won't go into it too much. The main thing that happens here is that the actor, the first player, begins to cry. And the actor's crying really affects Hamlet. To the extent that, um, I mean, it's sort of the thing that sets off Hamlet's second soliloquy. And that's right here. And it begins, now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, 
but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all the visage waned, wand, sorry, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice in his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, for Hecuba. So he's saying that, you know, he has plenty of reason to uh, act on his revenge, but he can't do it. He's sort of stuck. This actor here, though, can get into his role so much that he actually, he feels it completely. He actually, and he can cry. And what is he crying about? Well, he's crying about Hecuba. Hecuba's loss. What's Hecuba to him? And, and of course, Hecuba is, is not real. At least for the, 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 you know, the player in Hamlet. Hecuba is a mythological figure. And he calls it uh, a fiction, which is absolutely correct. Not only is it a fiction, but it's a nothing. This, this word is going to be very important a little bit later on in the play, but, but it's, it's important to note it here that it's, it's nothing that, that he is moved by. So he says, what's Hecuba to him or he to her that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and that for passion that I, had, I have? He would drown the stage in tears and cleave the general ear with hard speech. Make mad the guilty and appall the free. Confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy metal rascal, peak like John of dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. No, not for a king. Upon whose property in most dear life a damned defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my pate across, plucks my beard and blows it in my face. Tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie. I the throat as deep as to the lungs. Who does me this? Ah, swoons, I should take it. For it cannot be, but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter, or else this I should have fattened all the, reg the region kites with this slave's awful, bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. Oh, vengeance. Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave, that I, the son of a dear murdered, prompted to the vengeance of by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing like a very drab, a stallion. Okay, let me stop right there. And so he's beating himself up because he hasn't done anything. He's saying that uh, he, he must be pigeon-livered and lag gall. He must be a coward. He has all the reason in the world to seek vengeance because he's the son of someone who's been murdered. And he's been prompted uh, to take his revenge by this apparition from the other world. And what does he do instead? He unpacks his heart with words. Now we've gone over this quite a bit in class, I believe, but this is the opposition here. He's, he's about words, he's, at this moment he's not about action. The other thing that happens that he, when he gets very upset, he blames women. He doesn't really blame women here, but he does throw in some misogyny in saying, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab. So we've seen him do this before in his earlier soliloquy, fie upon it, foe. Um, he's just sort of uh, falling, uh, having a falling out here of reason. And he comes upon, uh, just kind of all of a sudden, comes upon this plan to 
have uh, to make a play with these actors who have showed up because he says that he's heard that guilty people, if they're watching a play and they see a scene that uh, represents the thing that they've done before, that they will uh, act out in some way. Here he says that um, they have proclaimed their malefactions. In other words, they've stood up and told everybody what they have done. It's interesting here that um, the Hamlet is thinking about making a play of fiction, nothing, in order to discover the truth, the reality of what has happened in the past. So there's a nice little ironic um, paradox, the sort of thing Shakespeare really likes. Also note that this is on the heels of another play-like situation that's about to happen, which is Polonius and Claudius behind the heiress watching Ophelia try to bait Hamlet in revealing something about his reality. So in a way, both sides of the conflict of the play of the play Hamlet are staging plays so that they can discover a reality by employing a fiction. So Hamlet um, describes that, you know, that he can watch his uncle and see if by his actions uh, in response to the fiction, whether or not he's been guilty. And he says, um, the spirit that I have seen may be a devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. So Hamlet is here acknowledging that he doesn't know whether the apparition is his father or not. He's also acknowledging that he's melancholic. And if he's melancholic, then he may very well have um, uh, act sort of crazy. And so because he thinks that the apparition might be the devil, and because he's, he's not thinking straight because of his melancholy, that he needs something uh, strong, some strong uh, uh, facts almost, some sort of reasonable reason to believe that his uncle killed his father. And so he says here at the bottom, I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And re recall that, you know, a, a few minutes ago, I mentioned that, that this word nothing is an important part of the, of the play. Note here also that he says the play's the thing. So the play's not a nothing. It's a thing. That's the thing that's going to catch the conscience of the king, sure. Earlier, however, when he was talking about the first player's speech, he said it was a fiction, a nothing. So within this soliloquy of his, we see him refer to the fiction of drama as being, on the one hand, nothing, a fiction, empty. And on the other hand, a thing, not a nothing, a thing. It can actually do something. Now, this uh, opposition here between thing and nothing corresponds to the opposition between the real and the seeming. And, and you know, I, I put a bunch of those oppositions on the board on Tuesday. And, and I suggested toward the end of, of the lecture that this would be um, aligning to the controversy of the Eucharist. Uh, during the time of the Reformation. So the Eucharist uh, was central to this um, change in people's attitudes towards Christianity. You know, there was a break 
between the traditional Catholic Church and um, this new Reformed Protestant Church. One of the things that the, the Reformed Protestant Church believed that was different than the traditional um, theology was that the Eucharist wasn't didn't miraculously become the blood and body of Christ. They imagined, actually, that it was a uh, remembrance, that one was supposed to do um, uh, be, participate in the Eucharist out of remembrance rather than because of some sort of miracle. And I want to I look at a, a verse from the New Testament. This is from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. So 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. And here uh, Paul is talking about uh, the Last Supper that Christ has with his disciples. And he says here that when Christ had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do This do in remembrance of me. Okay, what a lot of commentators will say about this is that for the traditional church, the important part is here, take, eat, this is my body. And the verb here is, is, it's, it's a thing of being. It's a, it's about being, it's about reality. This, it doesn't say this is like my body or, uh, <laughs> this is a similar to my body. Uh, he says, this is my body. And the traditional church took that um, as a literal as, as the verb itself. This is my body. So when the Eucharist, the miracle of the Eucharist occurs, then the cracker turns into the flesh of Christ. The Protestant church emphasize the second part of this verse more, which is this do in remembrance of me. So one thing to say about this is that um, the important word here is not a is not the verb, but it's this remembrance. It's about memory, which this play has been about from the very beginning, about Hamlet um being upset with himself that he that he has to remember. He wishes he could die because he can't forget. And then meeting the apparition, being told to remember his vow to take revenge and to remember his father. And his inability to take action upon that remembrance. The other thing to say is that this emphasis here on the isness, I guess we'll call it, but the literal, the being, reminds us of this distinction that Hamlet has made first to his mother, who talked about how his seeming, and he just sort of goes off and saying, It doesn't seem it is, and his insistence upon an internal reality that's more important than what's on the outside. Than, 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 than something that's beyond um, being. That's, um, well, ancient philosophers and the traditional church actually talked about the difference between um, an internal substantial reality of, of anything in the material world is sometimes different from its outside seeming or its appearance. Uh, the philosophers in the church called this outside um, appearance the accidents of a, of a uh, entity. The inside was called the substance. So the substance could be different than the outside. Now, I mentioned this on Tuesday, just say, say it again, that the way that people in the Western tradition tend to think about the nature of reality is that there that it is dual, 
that people tend to think of internal realities as being more important than external appearances. So the difference between substance and, and accidents, it, it may sound weird or uh, illogical when it comes to thinking about, uh, you know, the traditional church's way of thinking about the Eucharist, which is that it's a miracle and the cracker really does turn into the body. However, it still tastes like a cracker, etc. Still, still, um, and that it's digested like a cracker. So that might seem very interesting. That might seem weird or illogical. However, you know, we go through our lives probably thinking this way about some of our experiences. For instance, we tend to think about um, people in dual terms, that there's, there's, there, there's a sort of a real person and then there's the outside of the person. Um, if you were, t if you watch, saw someone behaving badly, for instance, your friend might tell you, oh, don't judge so-and-so by what you saw them do. Um, if you knew the real um, J Joe Blow, then you would you would actually like that person. So don't judge the person by their actions or don't judge the person by the way they look. Judge, get to know them and learn who the real person is and, and, and then you can judge, something like that. Um, so we do that with people. You know, we have the cliches like don't judge a book by its cover. The whole point here is that there's, there's, um, you know, there's a duality to the being. Of course, we also see this in um, uh, people's religious beliefs about the afterlife. Um, for a lot of Christians, in fact, the at the end of life, the soul goes uh, into a different realm, and that soul is the reality of the person. It's the it's the thing that really matters. The essential or substantial part of the person doesn't um, die it, it goes off into heaven or or hell or whatever the, the the belief is the however the kind of husk of the person the the material reality the body the body is the thing that that can die and it's different even though they're both sort of you know uh, mixed up with each other they they at least the way people believe you know that people walking around the earth, they may be dual in nature. There's a difference between the, the accidental material person and the, the inner real, you know, soul of the person, but nevertheless, you know, they exist, um, as, 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 as a singularity in some sorts of ways. So my point here is just to, to, to say that some dualistic thinking might seem weird to you however uh especially you know eucharistic theology might seem weird to you however there are probably ways in which you think about the world that are that are dual and don't seem weird to you during the protestant reformation there was a change in theology and what for a lot of people for probably the majority of people for a long time in the traditional church had seemed very uh, not only not weird not only sort of normal but also miraculously normal because remember this miracle this this miraculous event of the cracker turning into the flesh of christ for your consumption this occurred uh, on every street corner of of a place like london no, that's a no, that's an exaggeration not every street corner but just all over urban places like london in the traditional churches. Anytime that there's a service with a mass, the miracle would take place and the, um, the worshiper would be able to participate in the miracle um, and participate in the life of the God to the extent that they actually ate the flesh of the God. It seems weird. It was an everyday miracle for believers before one, the Reformation, wherein a bunch of people who changed their religion or just, you know, were Protestants, um, that they experienced the Eucharist as a metaphor, as a time to think on Christ, to mull over 
uh, their theology. This, by the way, this mulling over, this thinking, um, this not, in a way, acting, this not taking part in their religion to the extent that they eat the God, this mulling over, this remembering, is a lot like what Hamlet is doing here. That Hamlet is thinking about what he should do. He's mulling it over. He's actually turning his um, duty into an intellectual activity. He's even doubting. Um, he's doubting uh, what, in a way, his father. There's a good reason to think that he's doubting his father. Because he doesn't know what the real nature of the ghost is or the apparition. He doesn't know if it's a ghost of his father or a devil or perhaps something else. And there, too, we see that distinction between reality and appearance. It appears as if it's his father. But the question is, what is it really? Okay, so... Um, for next time, we will continue on with Hamlet. And um, thank you very much for uh, watching this video in lieu of a lecture. Um, I look forward to seeing y'all on Tuesday. Bye.